Hi, everybody, and welcome to Exegetically Speaking, a podcast to the friends and faculty of Wheaton College, Wheaton, Illinois, and the Lanier Theological Library in Houston, Texas. My name is David Capes, and I am the Senior Research Fellow at the Lanier Theological Library and a former dean up there in Wheaton at the School of Biblical and Theological Studies. Our purpose in these podcasts is really very simple. We want to promote the study of biblical languages, Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, so we can read the Bible more faithfully, study it more fully, and not just read it, but to live it. Joining me today on Exegetically Speaking is Daniel B. Wallace, the Executive Director for the Center of the Study of New Testament Manuscripts. He's also a Senior Research Professor of New Testament Studies at Dallas Theological Seminary. We have been wanting to have you on here for a while, Dan. Thanks for being with us. Yeah, thank you, David, for the invitation. So how did you get started reading Greek? When I was 16 years old, I decided to commit my life to Jesus Christ in such a way that I knew I was going to go into full-time Christian ministry. Hmm. And I, uh, at first, uh, became something of an evangelist, a junior in high school. And I found this real estate office, independent office, that had a big Jesus Save sign on it. <laughs> and so I said, well, this is a guy I probably would like to meet. Come in there, and I found out I can buy... Today's English version for 25 cents a piece, the paperback New Testament, if I bought them by the box load. Wow. And so I would buy the box load. I'd uh, drive up and down Coast Highway and pass out these Bibles as I picked up hitchhikers, and every few weeks I'd go back in and get some more. Well, in the many conversations I had uh, with this uh, fellow, I found out that he was an Arian. He did not believe in the deity of Christ. Hmm. There's not too many Arians who have signs, Jesus saves on their door. Yeah. So he was trying to show me in the New Testament where he thought it proved that Jesus was not God. Hmm. And that created some consternation. I can imagine. I thought, if I'm going to give myself to Jesus Christ, I want to make sure he's worth it. So it was because of that that I decided I need to learn Greek. It was because of a spiritual crisis that got me into the Greek New Testament. Hmm. And I went to uh, Biola University, and I got my first four years of Greek there. Who was your professor there? Harry Sturz was was the key person in my life, right? And I took even three independent study classes from him. So, when you took Greek, was it easy for you? Was it simple for you? Some people say, "Well, that's easy," or "No, it's hard." As hard as anything I've tried to do for you, what was it? It was not at all easy. I am not a particularly disciplined person. I'm a passionate person, and so to find just daily time to do stuff, it's, it's been difficult to get me to, to, to work like that. Mm. Uh, I almost flunked my first year, and Harry Sturz was compassionate toward me and let me get a passing grade because I was a Bible major, and Bible majors at Biola had to get two years of Greek, still do to this day. And so if I didn't pass first year Greek, I couldn't be a Bible major, so he, he let me get a passing grade. The next year, when I'm in second year Greek, I had a different professor, and in the first five weeks, this professor gave a review exam of first year Greek. On the first exam, I got an F. On the second exam, I got an F. On the third exam, I got an F. On the fourth exam, I got a high F. <laughs> And on the fifth exam, I got a D, and I thought, oh, I'm, I'm getting this stuff. Starting to get it, yeah. Yeah, and so the professor called me into his office. He said, young man, I think you need to check out a Greek. It was a wake-up call. Mm. I went down to my dorm room, and I said, Lord, I'm, I'm dragging your name through the mud. And I reflected on what would have happened if I'd gone to a secular school, UCLA, where half my high school kids went. And I was taking Greek from a non-Christian professor. It would not show off Jesus Christ very well if I were getting an F in that class. Hmm. And I thought, it doesn't matter if I'm at a Christian school or a non-Christian school. I live for one person, and I have to do my best. And Christians do not have the right to mediocre work just because they're in a Christian school. They should, no matter where they are, they need to do the very best work they do. should be doing the best. I end up getting the highest grade in the class both semesters. Really? Wow, what a transformation, yeah. that realization. Well, today we're going to talk about Romans chapter 3. Give us a little bit of the background. What's happening in Romans chapter 3? Paul is writing this missionary support letter to the Romans. It's the strangest missionary support letter you've ever seen, <laughs> where he rails against his audience for chapters 1, 2, and 3, 
have you ever gotten a letter like that from a missionary? Please send money. And by the way, you are awful. <laughs> I've uh, never gotten one of those. This, this is the <laughs> longest diatribe anywhere in the Bible about how sinful we are. Mm. Paul turns a corner at 321 to bring the good news. And 321 through 26 of Romans has been called the most important uh, non-narrative paragraph ever written. Some would even say it's the most important paragraph ever written in any literature. Mm. It is the heart and soul of the Apostle Paul. And Paul says in verse 21, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed, although it is testified by the law and the prophets. In verse 22, it says, even the righteousness of God, which comes either through faith in Jesus Christ or through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. There's been it's a big debate about that, right? Big debate. And that's not going to be what I want to wrestle with. Either way, what follows is to all who believe. Yeah. And then Paul goes on and makes a parenthetical note, for there is no distinction. Now, it's verse 23 and 24 that I want to focus on. So do you want me to just share some yeah, things here? Yeah, absolutely. Do you have more questions? Or? Yeah, no, I'm, I, let's just jump right into those key verses. Okay. That many of which, many people I know who are in discipleship classes have memorized Romans 3.23. Right. Right. And then, but they don't always go on to 324. Yeah. That's a critical miss. It's one of those forgotten verses. You know, everybody knows Ephesians 2, 8, 9, but not 10, that kind of right, thing. Right. So, yeah. Exactly. So, okay. Well, Paul goes on, same lengthy sentence. For all have sinned, hamarton, the aorist tense used in a very generic way that our whole life is viewed by God as one big blob of sin. Mm. And what's critical to get here next is, and whose teruntai do fall short of the glory of God. Hmm. I've read commentaries where they even translate this as, for all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. They've hmm. missed Paul's point here, and this is a critical point. Hmm. I want to begin by looking at the all. Most Christians, when they look at this, says, oh, this must mean all people. And it's, a, you know, you use the Roman road when you share the gospel. Mm -hmm. All have sinned, you're a sinner, you need Christ. I don't think that is what Paul is saying here. He has just qualified what the all is in the previous verse when he mm. says, Eis pontos tus pistuantos, all who believe. All who believe. And those all who believe are the all who have sinned. And those all who believe are also the all who are right now falling short of the glory of God. But then he goes on in verse 24. And he continues the sentence. Paul is fond of very long sentences. One German <laughs> scholar called his rambling blessing in Ephesians 1, 3 through 14, the longest sentence we have in the Greek New Testament, ein monstrositet. <laughs> it doesn't need to be translated. <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> so in verse 24, Paul uses a present adverbial participle, dikaiumenoi, being justified. Then he piles it on. Dora on, the accuser here is functioning as an adverb, being freely justified. He wants to make sure you understand this point by his grace. Hmm. And then he wants to make sure you really understand it through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. And this redemption was used of the purchase of slaves, you know, buying a slave out of the slave market. Hmm. And consequently, it's, it, Paul uses this vivid imagery. It was used in his day that way. Uh, but here's what I want to focus on. The all who have sinned are the all who continue to fall short, who are those who are freely justified by grace. Now, here's what happens with, with most exegetes in this passage. They start with a faulty understanding, I think, of the pontes in verse 23, as if it's a brand new sentence, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But then... They put a period at the end of verse 23, and they take this participle, dikaiumenoi, mm -hmm. as though it were an indicative. You are freely justified. That is hardly going to be the case in grammar. If you have an adverbial participle that agrees with a subject and in all the morphological issues it has to, the, it's got the same number, it's a plural participle, mm -hmm. and it's going back, it's in the nominative case, 
It's going back to the pontes of verse 23, which goes back to the pontos of verse 22. If you say that all who have sinned in verse 23 are all people, then you have a problem with the dukaiumenoi. That's true. Because it says all have sinned and all are freely justified. I don't think that's the case. And so exegetes, too many commentaries look at verse 23, they see it as universal statement, and then they have to do all sorts of gymnastics to get around the plain force of the participle in verse 24. Mm -hmm. It would be far better if they understood that the all in verse 22 are all who believe, which everybody gets that. Mm -hmm. It's the same all in verse 23. And those same all are believers who are freely justified. So the point here is, even while we are still falling short of God's glory with the, with the present indicative, mm -hmm. we are being freely justified by his grace. In other words, if I am a sinner and I'm justified at the same time, justification must mean a declaration rather than an impartation of righteousness. So God is declaring one righteous rather yes. than saying, I'm sharing my righteousness with you. Right. Now, he does do that, ultimately. Mm -hmm. And the whole progress of sanctification is that. But that's not the point Paul is making here. This is a declarative statement of God's dikaiosune theu, the righteousness of God, being imputed to us but not imparted to us. Mm -hmm. He looks on us in the courtroom as though we were not sinners because he sees the blood of Christ covering us. And it's while we are still continually sinning for the rest of our lives, we will continue to sin and we will still be freely justified. Martin Luther put it best, simul justus et peccator, hmm. simultaneously justified and a sinner. And that summarizes Romans 3, 23 and 24 pretty darn well. And that's who we are. Yeah, exactly. Dan, thanks for being with us today yeah. on Exegetically Speaking. Thanks, Dan. Thanks to Ian Rosine, Rebecca Larson, and Silvio Vasquez, who helped us produce this podcast. Thanks as well to John Lanzma, our Wheaton-based director, who makes this podcast possible. We're grateful to Phil Keggy for our music. If you want to study biblical languages, then you need to consider Wheaton College. Whether you're an undergraduate or a graduate student, we have amazing programs, a first-rate faculty, and some of the best students in the world. So go to the website, www.wheaton.edu, and look for Modern and Classical Languages. Get started today. If you have questions about this or any of our podcasts, we'd love to hear from you. If you have suggestions or questions about any passage in the Hebrew Bible or Greek New Testament, send us an email, and we'll see if we can get one of our experts to weigh in on that for you. Our email is exegetically.speaking at wheaton.edu. That's exegetically.speaking at wheaton.edu. Thanks for listening.